Resuming debate, the Honorable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and I too would like to extend happy birthday, and uh, yeah, yeah, sure there have been happier yeah, circumstances. I too have spent birthdays in this place, so I wish you well after all of this is over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, um, I wish to advise that I will be sharing my time with the Honorable Member for Acadie Bathurst. And uh, I'm hoping to take just seven and a half minutes of the 15 minutes. If you could let me know when I'm close to, say, a minute left. Thank you very much. Uh, the first question I'd like to put, Mr. Chair, to the Minister is, given the potential magnitude of increased risk to human life and environment from the massively expanded rail transport of petroleum products, the government is, allow is allowing, why has the federal budget for rail safety remained stagnant? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, if you look over the past number of years, what you'll see is that there's been an increase in the spending in rail safety. Our government has put $100 million in since 2009 based upon an analysis and a study that we undertook in 2007. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, in fact, it's been constant uh, 2012 uh, to 2015. So despite these incredibly awful uh, incidents we've had, there has not been an increase in uh, the allocation. My second question, Mr. Chair, to the Minister is, the recent 1,000-fold increase in shipping of oil by rail has become known as the pipeline on rails, yet no environmental assessments are required for this activity, unlike pipelines. As the government has said, it considers rail shipping of petroleum more risky than pipelines. Why does the Minister not require open, public environmental assessments of these activities? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Well, Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Member will know, railways and railroads in this country are private, and what they carry from shippers is their business in terms of moving through. But what we have done is we have rules and regulations that are around the transportation of dangerous goods. We have rules and regulations around railway safety, and we have taken unprecedented moves in the past nine months giving emergency orders and protective orders to ensure that safety is primary when we're talking about this increased risk because I agree, the more volume that's being shipped, the increased risk is there, but that's why we're acting so strongly to ensure that railways are doing at the best that they can. There are always going to be safety and environmental regulations that they will be subject to, as I mentioned, in terms of transportation of dangerous goods and railway safety. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. I'm absolutely stunned at the response. In the 21st century, it is astounding to hear the minister say, well, that's always the way it was and they should self-regulate. In fact, this is the second time this evening that we've heard that the government is proud to say um, that its activities are self-regulated. Maybe noted, uh, Mr. Chair, that the budget forecast for 2014-15 in the report on plans and priorities will reduce spending on environmental stewardship of transportation within the next two years by $18,000. My third question, Mr. Chair, to the Minister is, does the Minister believe rail companies should be exempt from open public assessment of risk to human life or health or the environment to build and operate massive terminals for 24-hour loading of bitumen and other petroleum products into rail cars? The Honourable Minister of Transport. So with respect to the particular example that the Honourable Member has given, I do believe that in order to uh, construct anything in the country, you probably have to do an environmental impact statement or a study, depending upon who's giving you the permit to do the construction in the area. It's not on federal land, so I can't speak to the details of it. I can tell you this, for the operation of key trains, which includes even a single, a single tank car of crude oil in this specific instance, we do demand that a safety assessment, that a risk assessment be taken into consideration, that be carried out in consultation with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and to make sure that they are doing what they can and to have all the operating procedures to keep the train on the tracks as part of their operation. And further, if the system is one in which the dangerous goods, such as crude oil, is being loaded at a facility. Our inspectors under the Transportation of Dangerous Goods Act can inspect the facilities as well, too. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Mr. Chair, it's not very reassuring that the Minister is simply saying she's assuming that it uh, may or may not be on uh, the rail company's land. Um, these are major facilities that are being built in my province, very close to the city of Edmonton. 
Uh, the municipalities are expressing concerns, and I think it's time to step up and take a closer look at this. These are major activities that require environmental assessment. Mr. Chair, I'm wondering when did the minister first know that there would be transportation bottlenecks in getting grain off the prairies and to market? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we became aware from CN and CP that they were having difficult in winter conditions in January. We could also see what the volumes of grain that were being moved in the country through our reporting mechanisms, and we understood from them that it would be a stretch for them to move the amount of grain that was being sought simply because of the temperatures they were experiencing in very parts of the country, which debilitated their ability to run a full train, and instead they had to run smaller trains. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Uh, Mr. Chair, a little stunning. Um, I just today was talking to one of her colleagues who in Alberta himself has not been able to get his grain off to market. So uh, we're hope we can only hope for better for next year, but uh, can't really be reassured. We're just hoping that more and more of our farmers are not going to go belly up. My next question, Mr. Speaker, is if the Minister thinks the changes in Bill C-30 to deal with the grain crisis are important, why do they all have sunset clauses? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Chair, this has been addressed before by the Minister of Agriculture on the same topic. The Sunset Clause is something that is it's administrative in nature and needed. Indeed, that discussion happened at committee, and indeed that amendment was not passed. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona, you're in your final minute. Mr. Chair, what measures did the Minister take proactively to prevent the backlog? <clears throat> The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, we always have conversations uh, through officials and through ourselves with the railway companies as to the movement of goods in the country. After we realized that there was such a difficulty, twofold, one was the amount of crop, second, the, uh, the difficulty in winter, we had meetings both with grain companies and as well with CN and CP to determine the best way to move the maximum amount of grain in the shortest amount of time. And that's exactly what we did with an incredible order which had never before been done in Canada with respect to the movement of a million tons of grain out of this country in a short period of time with monitoring and reporting back to us as ministers. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe I just have brief moments left. Um, in light of these inc increases in oil tanker traffic on the West Coast, can the Minister confirm that Transport Canada projects further cuts to funding for marine safety of nearly six million over the next two years. The Honourable Mem Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, what, uh, what the Honourable Member will note more importantly is the fact that we have increased uh, our funding in this area by 686 percent, and that has to do with our, our world-class tanker safety and the fact that we do strongly believe that with increased activity on all of our coasts that we need to ensure that we have a world-class system with respect to with respect to going forward. And I would say that any administrative cuts that you may see or decreases you would see are all activities that were back office that had nothing to do with safety. Exactly.